So I'm, I'm with Chris Barrett of the uh, as yet to be named JV for ITO. Welcome to okay. ITSM TV. Um, Chris, maybe just for our ITSM viewers, just maybe introduce yourself, let us know a little bit about yourself and what's happening in the short term with the JV. Yeah, certainly. So um, Chris Barrett, um, part of the uh, initial management team for the joint venture, that's both Cabinet Office and, and Capita. Uh, recently started, obviously we're, uh, we're pretty weeks or a couple of months into the, uh, the new joint venture uh, and really into the initial startup, uh, listening and development stage of, of the, uh, the new company. Uh, now for me that's all around um, setting up the company uh, and getting us live from the beginning of July. So that's, that's our immediate focus uh, and uh, my initial role is really some of the, uh, the transition uh, and getting us stood up uh, in, in good fashion. So, and we have a bit of um, scoop news or stock press news that we can you can announce. About. Absolutely. So today we've been able to announce our our new chief executive is, is Peter Hepworth, uh, previously of uh, Active Blizzard, and uh, join us um, uh, officially from the first of first uh, of July. Uh, and a very exciting times for us. Obviously, he's not a he's not a capita person. It kind of reinforces the idea that this is a this is a new company for us. It's a startup, uh, and is a global company. Obviously, Peter's got plenty of experience in developing, uh, growing, uh, listening to markets, uh, and developing products. So um, I'm certainly an excited person to see Peter here on board. Uh, Tell us just today. a little bit. You know, what's, what was the kind of deciding factor? That what, what was the real difference that made him the right man for the job? I think some of the vision around uh, the growth uh, and reinforcement around the strategy behind the, the JV. So this isn't a uh, this isn't a cost-cutting exercise. It's, a, it's a certainly a, an exercise in in taking what is existing in uh, in, in the communities, both PPM and, and ITIL, uh, taking the frameworks and uh, taking the existing uh, the existing work that's been that's been done, and being able to take that to the next level. And, uh, and an element of that is understanding markets, understanding communities. Uh, understanding products, and that's what that's what Peter brings. Uh, so if we talk about uh, nurturing communities, growing communities, uh, and developing products, uh, that's certainly where Peter's come from, uh, and that's the idea of bringing men. Okay, so I mean, community is, is, is a big word there in terms of you know it's quite a small industry, but it's quite a tight community. Yes, uh, if such a thing exists, what, what sorts of things do you think you'd be doing in terms of developing that side of it? You know, rather than just being commended. The return statement is we can't do it without the community. Um, the, the key factors for us is getting the practitioners involved, uh, taking a look at the, the wider stakeholder piece. I mean, there are a number of people out there that are uh, have a vested interest. Uh, hearts, minds, blood, sweat, and tears have gone into these things. We recognise that. Uh, that needs to be grown, uh, nurtured. Uh, that includes all stakeholders, not just practitioners. We're talking about vendors, uh, ATOs, EIs, the full community. Uh, and like I said, we're in we're in listening mode at the moment. So uh, listening to those ideas, learning from uh, what's gone wrong and right in the past uh, and developing again we've got five five routes to growth um, developing those is not going to happen without listening to the communities uh, and for me that means all stakeholders all stakeholders across the board and globally I mean what would be the you know we've had this concept of castle idol for, for a while whatever you think of that however relevant or, or, or pithy that might actually be I mean, how would you differentiate yourself from that kind of vision of, of the organisation. I suppose myself and Peter have both got the, the advantage of, of, of being relative newcomers. I mean, I've, I've got a, a background in delivering programmes as, as a transformation director. I've seen ITIL and uh, the, uh, the PPM products in, in use them in anger. Um, but as, as much as anything, I think we, we, uh, we need to recognise Castle ITIL is a, is a, is a is a, is, a, is a line that's been used, it's been recognised, it's been reused. Um, we're able to break it down, not just from um, from being newcomers uh, and having a fresh pair of eyes, but also in, in forming a JV with Cabinet Office. I mean, what we need to recognise here is the, the work of those guys at the moment and the constraints they're under. Uh, these are talented guys. Um, they are uh, obviously the custodians of, of the IP. And uh, to be frank, there's an element of frustration on their side as well. Um, the shackles have been on. It's a government department. Um, they have their, their own duty of care as 
as civil servants. They've not had the investment behind them, perhaps, um, that they would like to do. Uh, they have plenty of ideas, I can assure everyone of that, many people have seen this. Um, and, and, and breaking open those ideas and the barriers to talking to the community is something that they'd like to see as well. So, as much as anything, it may be a Castle Itil. Um, we can also talk about breaking down the walls of Castle Itil from, from the inside, as well as newcomers and myself. So, uh, um, there's, there's plenty to go out there. Okay, I mean, what, what do you think will be, you know, like a year or two down the line, what do you think will be different, particularly for the, you know, the, um, the, the ITSM man on the on the Clapham bus, um, or, you know, for our international friend, you know, the guy in the street, what, what will actually be different, do you think, for them? As opposed to the industry, the man on the street, the practitioner, um, or well, we recognise the, uh, the changes in the way people are learning at the moment. So uh, it would be a miss not to mention the, the gamification, the simulation that we can bring to uh, learning techniques, learning styles, and the, the actual training courses themselves. But it's all about training. It's about the, uh, the usefulness and the relevance of, of the product. So we've described previously a core product. We've described areas we'd like to explore of uh, uh, assimilating, working with areas like USM Bock and, and Agile and others to provide that uh, that relevancy to to the practitioner the other extra added piece there is some of the um, some of the return on investment. So, as a as a C-suite person, as a CIO, what is the value of putting a number of people through these training courses? There's a, there's an element of science we'd like to develop in there, and that's that's a direction of travel for the product. So, relevancy, pragmatism, and recognizing some of the other uh, some of the other tools out there, making it making it more useful. Uh, but I'd like to see it making it uh, de not demonstrably valuable to that to that CIO as well. Well, I mean that's been. You know, for me, it's, it's been one of the things for years is just having good data about the ROI and you know, if you're talking about net present value, all that kind of stuff. But you know, just what what is the value of doing this? How do we get the investment? How do we justify it and and then record the success of it? Yeah. Um, do you think you'll be looking to gather that kind of information and feed it back to the industry? I think that's certainly that's what we'd, we'd like to look at, that we'd like to use. So if, if, the, if, the, um, if, the, if the end game is, is demonstrating the value of, uh, of ITIL and of course the PPM products as well to the, uh, the C-suite people that are investing heavily in their companies to get people through these training courses, mm -hmm. then that, that's the end game. How we get there is something I think we need to, to talk about and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and involve the communities, the stakeholders. One other quick question is, is that thing about, you know, we have this thing about two-speed ITIL. Um, which has been proposed, you know, that actually every four or five years is not fast enough, particularly these days. Um, will you be looking at that as, as, an op as an option to produce some sort of regular content rather than just, you know, one big bang every five years? I think it's something we've got to look at. So again, in listening mode, we're listening to the communities. If we're, if, if, if we're hearing a uh, two-speed ITIL is, is either working or not working for some people, and this is across the value chain, it's across I ITOs updating their training materials, it's across other people and practitioners finding it useful to use something, but hang on, it's, it's X number of years old and the last iteration I've not seen or won't come out for another two years. If we're hearing that's not useful, and I think it goes into the melting pot, and we decide collectively what the, the best future of release management for, for ITIL actually is. So definitely something we're looking at. No quick answers, though. I think we all recognise there's no quick answers there. Okay, and just the last question: just you know, the next six to nine months, what uh, what do you see in terms of the organisation that you're building? What's what's going to be happening? Um, I think as much as anything is putting the right people in place for the initial organisation, so the, the, the JV, obviously it needs a name, it needs its own branding, it needs the, uh, the, the kick-off from 1st of July. We, uh, we obviously need to build a collective company, so we're in full startup mode, and hence some of the excitement around uh, uh, having the new startup, the new, uh, new build uh, company, but also getting uh, uh, the, the engagement through the communities, key to us, uh, and minimising the disruption as well. So a number of things will stay the same all the way through to uh, 2014 and probably beyond as well. So minimal disruption, but at the same time, recognising there's product development to do and there's ways of improving the operation globally as well. And just one question on that, just, you know, we, we, we do hear people, I mean, I hear what you're saying about being open and transparent and, <coughs> you know, we, we see organisations saying they're going to be doing that <coughs> and then, you know, stuff happens. I mean, how, how can you... Can you give us some kind of assurance that you, you will be continuing to be as open as possible over the next years? Or yeah, the, the, the proof will be in, in, in me being here on your next 
podcast or, or, or Peter or another person. So I think we recognise that, uh, that, that, that there are ways of communicating and ways of being open. It's being uh, personalities within the company, being open on Twitter and other feeds, uh, demonstrating uh, you know, the, the openness through whatever interviews, blogs. The proof will be in X number of months' time when I'm, I'm standing in front of another camera, perhaps. Well, thank you. This is a great start. This is the first time we've had the opportunity to do that already. So thank no, you very much. Pleasure. Thanks for your time. To the next one. Excellent. Thanks, Barclay. Thank you.